I am Michael Hassel of Esports GG, interviewing Rasmus Philipson, better known as Misery. Uh, Misery, thank you. I thought I'd start with going over some of your background, just kind of some history. Uh, you've had an incredibly long career in esports in Dota, approaching 14 years, I think, if you count Dota 1. Yeah, yeah, that's that sounds right. What do you kind of attribute your longevity to? How have you stayed in esports for so long, do you think? Well, I mean, I started pretty young, right? Esports was also pretty young back then, so it was I was kind of growing with it, right? Just experiencing the growth of esports from the very beginning to having bring your own computer tournaments and sleeping in sleeping bags and whatnot, and then you know it's kind of blowing up. And then I was kind of lucky that it was uh, that Dota turned out to be my game, right? Could have been a bunch of other games, but yeah, it could have been Warcraft three and. That kind of died to death, sadly, but... Yeah, I mean, there's so many games out there, right? And I was kind of lucky that Dota was the one, you know, becoming so big and, and I could make a career out of it. Looking back over kind of your career and whatnot, one thing you do kind of notice is that you've been on a lot of uh, American teams. Is that because you've kind of got a, a soft spot for NA, you kind of like the scene, or is that just going with the flow? Yeah, I think it's more like going with the flow. I don't know if I have a soft spot for any region particularly. Um... I also played in China for a while, so yeah, it's kind of yeah. it, it's kind of just where the you know the path took me or whatever, and the like decisions made in the in the moment kind of thing. So it's not. I mean, once I was in NA, maybe I stayed there for a while, right? Because it was more natural or whatever. But it wasn't like a, a intended decision. Do you think that's a good piece of advice for kind of up and coming players? Then go with the flow. Don't worry about oh, I've got to play in Europe. I've got to play in uh, CIS or something like that. Mm, well, it also felt like it was maybe easier before, because, uh, why is that? Yeah, it, it felt like it was easier before. Nowadays, it's it's more, it's harder to play in across regions, I would say. Maybe it's the format that has changed it. Maybe it's the organizations or the, you know, the lack of tournaments, perhaps. But now, it's, I feel like it's, there are some teams who are still doing it, but it's definitely significantly harder than it used to be. Yeah, I think with the format, because you used to travel a lot, you didn't necessarily have to be based in the same region as your team, maybe. Yeah, so. I mean, also when I played in NA, there was a bunch of organizations like Complexity, and we had like DC, right? And it was EG back then even, and there were some teams who had, you know, were able to boot camp, and the, the region was overall perhaps more competitive. I'm not sure, but yeah, there might be a bunch of reasons. But I mean, it's it's overall, it's it might still be the same, you know. That's the that all the, the team, sorry, Bang Mahon, all the all the TIs in Seattle. So you, right? Na Na was the center of Dota in a lot of ways back then as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Linked to that, you were part of that. We we mentioned it, the Digital Chaos roster that had that incredible run at TI six. Uh, you search for low bracket, you come against Wings in the final. Any interesting memories from that roster, from that experience overall? I mean, there's so many, like, kind of... We had a really rough time going into TI. I think we lost most tournaments, lost a lot of games. I think people more or less had accepted that the team might not function or whatever. And then when we got into the tournament, we just started hitting a groove and just play Like, each of us just played our best and, you know, some common momentum was gained. And, yeah, we ended up doing it. I'm not sure. It just felt like uh, we were really strong and everyone was very slow. To be fair, I think we also did practice a lot. Like we had bad results, but we were working really hard up till uh, up till TI happened. We played like every day, like many, many games and uh, yeah, and, and didn't stop working just because, you know, it was a bit discouraging in a way that we kept losing. That's got an interesting point. Like, do you think a losing team ends up working harder than a, a team that seems to having success? Because they're trying to catch up. Yeah, I mean that's that's for sure. I think the, the that's why it's so hard to be consistently winning, right? Is is that everyone who's losing is just trying to work hard to remove, like to go where you are, kind of right. And the the winning team is, you know, it's much, it's a lot easier to just be like, ah, oh, we're the we're the best, you know, we don't need to work as hard. I think a lot of there's a lot of examples in that in just you know all sports and esports as well. Delving a little bit more into ancient history. Sorry to keep diving into the past, but. Uh... Recently, we had one of the most notable beefs in Dota 2 f on the verge of being squashed, I would say. Uh, Fly and No-Tail, who had that big dramatic split at ESL 1 Birmingham 2018. Fly came out with an interview a few days ago, uh, effectively apologizing for how he handled things back then. But mm -hmm. one thing that people do forget from that OG EG spot is that you were kind of on the receiving end of that 
in that you were the EG on that EG spot, I believe. Um, yeah. Do you have any memories of what it was like at that time? And what are your kind of feelings on it now? Like having so many years removed from it? Well, I mean, I think it was, it was, it was obviously a kind of a hard time for me, but, but to be honest, it was probably for the better. I, I don't think I, we worked really well together in EG. The, that team was not functioning, you know, it was really hard for me to, to come in and be captain for that team. I felt like there was a lot of pressure and a lot of, yeah, just, it, it didn't, it didn't really work out that well. Our results were kind of uh, underwhelming as well. Even though we were really close to actually making it work, it was just like, just not enough. And then, yeah, I think it was a good, good decision for both teams, but it was obviously, you know, you know, sad, sad for me in a way, but yeah, looking back at it now, I think it was the right decision by by them to go for something like this because yeah the team was not working out did you find out about that like in birmingham like uh the kind of dramatic the thing is that oh with they everyone found out at the hotel the night before is that kind of how it worked out or was that yeah kind of i mean i i did feel like the the team the, the, the team really was not functioning well right for for a while and um we kept going and we actually had a really good boot camp before the birmingham tournament and uh we were beating everyone um and uh, I feel like the moment we lost, because <clears throat> we dropped out, we actually lost that crazy game where Eternal Envy and uh, I think it was maybe DJ playing IO and they relocated to our found, uh, to our base and killed the throne through like tier falls and throne through backdoor. Yeah. That was like so crazy. We lost that game. And then, I don't know, we lost another series as well to a really angry Russian team. And then suddenly we were just out, you know, because that's how the format was the tournament. And, I feel like the moment we lost the tournament, I was like, yeah, I, I felt like I was getting kicked already at that moment, <laughs> actually. I, I kind of knew it, you know, deep yeah. down. And um, yeah, it, it didn't take many hours. And then I, I started writing people, hey, you know, talk to me. Am I, am I, you know, I just want to know, you know, what's happening. And then, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty clear. Okay. So that's a really yeah. good insight. Thanks. Um, I understand that you've been looking more into casting recently. Um, Obviously, we've seen you take up the caster role before. Uh, there was quite a few times in 2020 where you were on the desk, or uh, you had some analyst work last year, I believe. But the most recent was the Intel World Open in Beijing. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a, a little bit about the experience of that? Uh, how was that to work that uh, event? Yeah, I don't know. I had just had a, a killer pigeon reached out to me on uh, on Twitter saying that, that he needed a co-caster for this event, like the, this. You're still covering this China event, this Beijing tournament. Not nobody really announced it or heard much about it, and uh, they flew us to Poland and we casted this event. And I mean, it was a lot of fun, and I, I enjoyed it to be honest. Um, it, the games were really good. It was a bit sad that they that there was not so much coverage. Like people didn't really know that it was happening until like the last day. Um, but it was it was kind of fun to try. Also, just like in the past, maybe I've been an analyst like as a guest or. You know one series here and there or whatever but this was like interesting to try to work as a talent and we were working like night hours because we were following beijing time so that was a bit that was a bit challenging but overall it was a lot of fun Brilliant. yeah i will mm -hmm. say that it was it was surprising that that tournament didn't get so much coverage because it had a lot of big names in it like top you know level one dbc yeah. talents so i don't know what they why they didn't broadcast that to the world but um you worked with uh, Killer Pigeon, Darren Elmy, on that. Uh, you had some pretty good synergy from what I've seen on those. Uh, but are there any of the talents you'd really like to work with on the kind of casting desk? Anyone you aspire to kind of work well, with? Well, I mean, I, I know that I have a pretty good relationship with most of the casters because, I mean, they when there was like tournaments all the time running, I was at, at most of them. And we always hung out and played Mafia and whatever else at these events. So, yeah, I like kind of all the, all the guys. From, uh, from the English talent, at least. No, and no one in particular, just like, oh, it'd be great to work with them or anything like that. You're, you're, I guess, you're flexible. Uh, you're flexible. You're... I'm pretty flexible. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I'm probably more analytical, right? I wouldn't be able to like do any play by play okay. that much, I think. So it would probably be more one of the guys that can uh, take care of that part. That'd be good. No, that'd be yeah. interesting. Uh, you might have a little bit of competition in former players coming into casting. Uh, no tail jumped onto the desk at Gamers Galaxy. Have you seen much of his casting? Do you think you'd make a good duo with him? He he does a bit of play by play. You've got a bit of uh, analysis. Do you think that work? 
Um, yeah, I'm sure it would. I mean, he also brings a lot of energy that, you know, I, I saw the cast in, in, from the Dubai tournament. That was a lot of fun. I thought, especially the final cast where it was, was a Kuroki Sumail and, and no yeah, like that, that was, was very uh, fun. Yeah. That was really fun to watch. Um, but I know like, there's a lot of talent. Like there's a lot of represented talent all around, all across the board. It's not easy to just, uh, swoop in and, and, and take over right there's uh, So yeah. There's a lot of good guys out there casting, so, and it's also it's also hard work. That's something I realized when I was doing the Beijing tournament. Like, people take a, give a lot of shit to casters, right? But it's very hard work. You work very long hours. You cast a lot of games, and a lot of you keep seeing the same things in the games. It's hard to actually say. You, you also say keep repeating yourself, right? So it's hard to actually keep it continue to keep it interesting and uh, and to have the energy to entertain people. It it, it is kind of challenging yeah um you also mentioned oh you, you mentioned about the coaching something you're maybe looking towards and obviously you do have some experience in that as well with uh pain gaming uh mm -hmm. do you have a coaching style or how would you describe your your method of coaching or oh uh, i don't know i didn't coach them for very long but uh yeah, you moved on to the roster i think quite quickly <laughs> yeah but i thought i thought it was because like when you're playing, when you're in the game, yeah. and like you are, your all your energy is is focused on, on playing. It's uh, your mind's kind of on that, right? With the Brazilians, and then when I was coaching those guys, it was kind of while they were while I was watching the games, while in the break and stuff, I felt like I had so much time to do a lot of other things because I didn't have to play pubs, I didn't have to, like, all the stuff you do as a as a player. I had a lot of time, so I was like I was cooking for them a bit, and I was like doing other things as well and i found it very interesting and very kind of fun in a way like different but i think it's definitely something that i would like to try to do in the future at some point to try to be coached because i think it uh, i could do a really good job i think um as a coach yeah it's not the most visible thing in dota 2 coaching you don't mm -hmm. have many big famous coaches uh like there are in some other games but are there any coaches in Dota 2 right now that you think of maybe like leading the way or people you think that are a great example of good coaching or whatnot? It's it's also uh, like you you even said it yourself a little bit there. It's hard to really know uh, what a coach does for a team unless yeah. he's coached yourself because like they are very under the radar. They don't get much praise for what they do. Um, I've been coached by 1437 and I've been coached by Balba. And uh, I think that on secret one four three seven or was that? Yeah, I think he he helped us a lot when he came in as a coach, and he was doing a really good job. He just came in like a couple of weeks before the boot camp and helped us out, and then we won the Shanghai major. I don't I don't think he, yeah, he continued as coach, I believe, but you know, but that was like a really good example of what a coach can do because he gave us some fresh ideas, he gave us all confidence, and uh, like he helped me with certain heroes that I was not really feeling so much and uh, kind of gave me an idea of what I should be thinking on those heroes. And yeah, he helped me a lot and he helped the team a lot. And as for Bulba, I also think he like, he gets a lot of shit too. And he's also worked really hard for, yeah, in, in the years that, you know, I know him. And uh, I think he did a really good job as well. Like he, if I was going to be coaching some team now, I would definitely think of some of the things he's done to keep things structured. Like he coached us as well in DC at Boston Major. And uh, he, yeah, I don't know, I just like how he kind of prepared the team before the matches. Like we would, I would with him talk with him about the, the other team and then we would kind of go over, like kind of brief the team, you know, on what we should be thinking and what kind of heroes we should worry about or whatever, just a game plan overall. I think like this type of like structuring it a bit more. Um, I think that's something in Dota that is kind of lacking. I think a lot of teams still do like that. I think probably the teams that are successful are the ones who are implementing some more structure in their, yeah, in their, you know, you know, scr scrimming or scheduling or whatever, just like, just more structure so you understand what, what you're working on or like what's going on with other teams and stuff like that. That's so interesting think, yeah. that you'd say that because I know that um, there was obviously that big team secret run in 2020 and then he wins coach of the year of all these in the esports awards mm. and it shows that i suppose with a coach just being there there you can get a lot of results just from structure and having a plan and 
Dota in some ways is still very seems like it's just five guys get together and start playing the game and that yeah. doesn't always seem like it's going to be going to work. I mean obviously some coaches that are also really like really good coaches is uh I mean she, he mentioned Heen right of course but uh, there's also like Shao 8 and RTK and I think there's a there's a big difference between how teams use their coach like Nigma has RMN right like yeah. RMN has played Dota as long as I have pretty much and but he's Kuro's really good friend and now he's just kind of an integrated part of the team um whereas the RTKs and the Shao 8s are more like almost the captain of the team right drafting and everything and so I think the the ro the ro uh, the role of the coach is very different depending on the team. Yeah, and it comes back to that adaptability, like being willing to be flexible onto what a team wants uh, compared to. Yeah. Thing. No. Um, moving on from casting coaching a little bit, then uh, mm -hmm. we finally got a patch in the game at the end of last month. We've had about a month with it now, maybe about twenty days, probably less than that. How do yeah. you like the changes in general? Happy to see the end of Techies? Do you like Primal Beast? What What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on the current patch, kind of? Um, I don't like the new stuff, like Techies, Primal Beast. I don't think too much of it. I think it's I haven't played either hero yet. I don't know. For me, it always takes a while for me to get into these new heroes. It's not. It doesn't really interest me too much. Whereas I think the like the shard is a cool change. The fifteen minute shard. I also think that. I don't know, I just think that these kind of small changes to heroes are good. I I was also expecting a bigger patch, to be honest, but what I really miss in general is just this small two, three week small updates. Mm. Like, I don't want to keep playing my pubs against uh, last pick TA or last pick Huskar and just lose the game because I just feel like I get cheesed too much and people are getting too used to, okay, these heroes are the best heroes in the game. We're going to just keep spamming those. And to kind of cheese our way to win. I think that's so common in, in high matchmaking. I don't know how it is on lower tiers, but I think something that Valve used to say a couple of years ago, I think, was that they would have these two-week Thursdays, I think, where they would give a like kind of an update patch. And I think they could do that again. like Because I, I do think there are some heroes that are too powerful, right? And yeah, why not just give them a slight, slight nerf here and there, right? Some of the heroes that don't get played at all, give them a little buff. And then just, you know, every two weeks, there's going to be a kind of a little change. I think yeah. that could be a really good way of keeping the the game fresh and interesting. I still like the game a lot, yeah. so it's still, it's still okay. I just think that it is a bit, yeah. And with that, the, the, the fact that you're kind of not messing around with the techies or the primal, primal beast, yeah. a lot of I that, mean, they're not, they're not in competitive yet, so it's kind of like... Feels... I played against them a lot, right? Yeah. And yeah. Almost obviously, always Primal Beast comes out and he just walks on people and they just die. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, it's yeah. pretty it's pretty standard that the new hero has some kind of tool that looks completely broken. Um, so that's kind of, you got kind of used to that. Um, I think his concept is kind of fun. I think his, yeah, his toolkit is, is kind of, kind of fun. And then the techies, I think is a little disappointing. I, I mean, I also didn't like techies before. I like playing it. I didn't like playing against it, um, but it was kind of unique. It had a very unique place in the game, whereas now it's kind of very meh hero that kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, what about hero balance at the moment? There, we did touch on it briefly. You think mm. it wants to be a bit? You like to see more changes? But I was watching, like obviously watching the DPC. There seems to be a situation where people are, for instance, like invokers. 100% pick and ban, but it hasn't won a game. That's in the the uh, Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Pango gets through and it has a 100% win rate. He's doing really well. Do you think yeah. people are still feeling out the patch, or do you think um, it's? Do you think it's just you know that's just competitive and it's a coin flip and sometimes you're not going to win the match? Mm. I mean, I just watched Secret against uh, Tundra, and I think. Like I played a, like a, a bunch of pubs this week, and I feel like the Tundra's drafts are very... It's kind of like there's this hints of what I see in my pubs, you know? Okay. Some Coddle mid. I mean, they also have the your, your signature heroes in IO, Gyrocopter, Monkey King, and stuff like that. But it just feels like the high-level matchmaking, to some extent, dictates what's good. I mean, there are so many people who are working really hard to win MMR, and I think there's a lot of stuff that can be used from pubs 
uh, a lot more than you think. And uh, so I think the high matchmaking pops to some extent kind of dictates the, the meta in Europe. Um, what was the question? Oh, do you Actually, think people are still uh, feeling out the, the patch? Or, oh, or... yeah. I think that I think it still takes a little while. There are some still some heroes that are like for example this Ven hero with the new shard, like where is he at? You know, is he is he a support? Is he a core? Like some people played it core, I think it was OG. Yeah. And uh I I mean this hero looks really strong, but it's kinda up in the air, right? The same for Coddle, he's also been gone for a while. Now he's suddenly back and where does he actually fit in the game? And I think there's a lot of heroes sort of like that. And it can be it can be hard luck about playing one one match a week, right? And then you have to like narrow all this many, many variable heroes down to what's actually the best. Um Yeah. Uh talking more to maybe your kind of what you kind of play in game with supports, uh when I first saw the patch notes come through and I saw all these creep changes, uh my mind immediately went to Chen. I think a lot of people's minds immediately went to Chen. I think I saw celery and uh uh, puppy and a few other people just pick up Chen immediately in pubs and just see if they can mm. do something with it. Uh, but then in games, not really come out. I think it just hasn't worked out. But on the other hand, one hero that you're known for, the Bane, is getting a lot of play and is doing quite well. What do you think about what are good supports right now? Do you think in kind of high level play? Um, I think I think Inch is really good. Uh, now I don't have to get the the hero list open right now but i think to me enchantress seems really strong it's also there are so many viable heroes so like one series you might see secret first two inch and then the next series they don't touch it at all i just looked it's not banned or picked in their game and that, yeah, that's wild. weird to me a bit like what happened there um but but there are like io is also really strong for some teams but other teams don't really touch it at all i mean it's kind of the same with inch right so it almost it's kind of kind of depends on the on the patch and I, I mean on the team and I also don't think it's really figured out yet. Like uh, before, it was always like Weaver, you know, over and over and over again, yeah. and Bane, like you said. But I feel like the normal post five, like the Bane and the Disruptors, are they're still good, but they're not as it's not as clear, you know, what's the best just yet. But for me, Ench seems to be very strong right now. I think. I saw some criticism of that kind of Ench pick, not because it's a bad pick, but because it's kind of a, it's encouraging quite a passive meta. You, you know, you get your Enchantress, you wait for your gut a few creeps, and then you burn a, a you burn a tower down and you, you avoid fights. It, do you think the meta is good right now, or do you think you'd like to see it change a bit to be more active, more proactive, I suppose? Hmm. Uh, I think, I mean, the thing is, like, we had really good games that uh, I think that the meta hasn't changed too much since the last patch. Yeah. And I, but I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because we had so many amazing games in Dubai. That was before the patch, right? I think that might have been on, the first one on the patch. Was that, was that on the patch as well? Yeah. Well, regardless, I think the what was so amazing about that event is that you have so many games in short amount of time which means all the teams are kind of on the same level and on the same mindset of what works and what doesn't work and what the enemy is going to do and then you know there's this whole meta game going on so the drafts are much more even whereas now in the dpc you have one match a week and you don't know what the other team is doing at all because you're also paying much attention to let's say you're playing uh, liquid next week you're not going to scrim against liquid during this time right you're going to play some other teams and then both teams might scrim different partners and then you have a very different idea of what's good and then you end up with these very skewed drafts perhaps even though the teams are much more close when it comes to skill. So I think that, yeah, it's fair that you see very hype games in this DPC because there there's so many outdrafts happening. I think today was a really good example. Like Secret lost two really fast games and, you know, they looked really outdrafted in both games. I thought I'd get your thoughts on kind of a developing story just in Dota 2 right now. Uh, Nigma had the gate postponed because uh, their players tested positive for COVID. And people yeah. quickly compared that with Boom Esports, like a, a few days ago, had to forfeit because of a power cut. And you've kind of got like a, a who can control either one of those things. I think the point being that like one league's been quite harsh to players and one league is kind of being quite a lot more lenient. Do you think there should be a more consistency across the leagues for the rules? Or do you think you, you've got to take it case by case for a reason? 
Uh, I don't I don't know. This is some ideally in the ideal world there's some clear cut rules that you know does it. But at the same time, like I would prefer that the games get postponed instead of forfeit because you know there have not that many games and if somebody gets uh COVID or a power outage or whatever i think it's fine to try to postpone it obviously it sucks for the team and it just sucks in general for everybody but i think it's better than the because there, there's also so much on the line right like in the in the dpc there's so few games like you don't really have a you know a way to to get those points back uh, from the from the league so yeah i think the better play is probably to just postpone the games like they did in Europe. Yeah. No, I think I'm, I'm, I agree with that, definitely. I think postpone them. I want to see more Dota. I don't want to see FF marks in Liquipedia and whatnot. Um, mm. Finally, I know we talked about your kind of casting and coaching, but if the right offer for a team came along, would you jump back into it? Would you go for it? Are you kind of still looking for team and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I I was I was I was thinking about playing this year this season of as well. I had a couple of offers that I was considering. I was trying to make a team in the beginning of the season as well in August, but yeah, the team I don't know just couldn't make it work. Uh, like they couldn't find the players, and yeah, it just didn't happen. And then I had some offers throughout the year, but I feel like I wanted I wanted to be something that I really believe in. And I don't want to just play for the sake of playing. I've kind of done that for a couple of years now and to some extent. <clears throat> and uh, it doesn't feel good, especially not in the, the way the uh, the DPC works and the ecosystem of Dota. Like you're kind of playing for free, more or less, unless you can make the TI. And there's a lot of like very few games being played, right? Official games. So yeah i feel like the the incentive is not really there for me right now i have you know some other th i've enjoyed my social life and done other things uh outside of the game um but i still i still play a lot and i still love the game so of course if the right opportunity is there i'm gonna i'm gonna go back into it um yeah no doubt oh, brilliant then um for, la very last thing then uh mm -hmm. is there anything else you want to get out there on the interview or any messages for fans of yours or anything like that not really. I mean, I'm following the war in Ukraine a lot, and it's it's very fucking sad. And uh, I hope that that gets resolved soon, so the world can go back to whatever it was before, which was always kind of ridiculous. But you know, hopefully that that gets resolved because it's uh, it's kind of depressing time. Yeah, and that's kind of all, I guess. Really well. Thank you so much for the interview, Rasmus. Thank you for the uh, everything, reaching out, and everything like that. It's been brilliant. Yeah, that's just it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs>